Well, yesterday I tried to get you prepared on how to use the early chapters of Genesis as a witnessing tool. What I've learned as a pastor is it's difficult to get people to share their faith uh, with non-Christian adults if they're not prepared to deal with the challenges they're going to face in the book of Genesis. And people often ask me, okay, in fact, I got questions about this card yesterday. Of these four, where would you start uh, with a skeptic? And I says, well, the most compelling scientific evidence comes from the universe. Why? Because astronomy is the only scientific discipline where we get direct access to the past because all of our information comes to us from past events. It takes light time to travel from these galaxies to our telescope. And we actually now have telescopes so powerful, we can see all the way back to the cosmic creation event. Now, some people think that's got to be an exaggeration. This is how close we can get images back in time. We can actually see the state of the universe when it's a hundred billionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a second old. That's so close we can get to the cosmic creation event and explains why we get the most compelling evidences for the God of the Bible from the discipline of astronomy. However, there's a serious weakness. We astronomers are totally ignorant of the present. That's why when I talk to my wife, I say, you can't hold me accountable for the present. I'm an astronomer. Uh, I'm only accountable for past events. So, well, let's jump into this. Cosmic reasons to believe in Jesus Christ. And sometimes what I get from my fellow scientists and engineers, I say, okay, we can understand how science reveals God. How does it reveal the person of Jesus Christ? So we're going to take that on this morning. And here's a quick outline of where I'm going to be taking you. We're going to look at cosmic reasons for why the causal agent of the universe must be transcendent beyond space and time. The number two, why this transcendent causal agent must be a personal loving God and finally, why it must be a redeeming God, a God intent on redeeming billions of human beings. And that's what really separates Jesus Christ from the gods of the other religions. Now, as I mentioned yesterday, I became addicted to astronomy when I was seven years of age. And the first book I read in cosmology at age seven was a book by Fred Hoyle called Nature of the Universe. Now, Fred, was very opposed to Christianity, and he made no bones about it in this book. But one of the things he said in this book that caught my attention at age seven, he says, there's a good deal of cosmology in the Bible. It is a remarkable conception. And it was at age 17 that because of astronomy, I became persuaded there had to be a God to explain the universe. And I began to go through the holy books, religions of the world, and I discovered what Fred said back there and the nature of the universe indeed is correct. That if you compare what the Bible says about the origin and history of the universe to all the other holy books, it says about 10 times as much as all the other holy books combined. And as I began to go through uh, the Bible at age 17, I found that there were four features of the universe that the Bible repeatedly addressed. And these are the four that the universe is traceable back to a singularity beginning. Now that's a physics term, which means a beginning of matter, energy, space, and time. That the universe continuously expands from that space-time beginning. It expands under laws of physics that do not change, and that one of those laws is a pervasive law of decay. Now, what I'm going to do in the next few minutes is show you where in the Bible these statements are made and what the latest discoveries in astrophysics do to establish so what the Bible said thousands of years ago indeed is correct. As I mentioned yesterday, no matter where I travel in the world, everybody knows Genesis 1-1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But this isn't the only text that talks about the singularity beginning of the universe. For example, you got in the New Testament, Hebrews 11.3, the universe that we can detect did not come from that which we can detect. Well, what can we detect? We can detect matter, energy, space, and time. And these are several other texts. And as I mentioned yesterday, God actually claims to initiate his works of redemption before he even creates the universe. There actually is a beginning of space and time. 
the grace of God that we now experience was put into effect before the beginning of time. What's unique about the Bible is it actually speaks about the beginning of the universe as the beginning of space and time itself. Quite different from what you see in the Eastern face, where it says that space and time are eternal and God creates within space and time. In biblical faith, God is actually the master of space and time. He's the creator of space and time. He's not subject to it. Now, as I mentioned yesterday, I was reading the Bible seriously for the first time when physicists in Britain were developing the first of the space-time theorems. There's now 30 of these theorems that have been published, and I brought with me the latest of these space-time theorems titled, Inflationary Space-Times Are Not Past Incomplete. I mean, I don't know where they come up with these titles, uh, but this is a paper you simply can't put down once you get into it. If you're fans of tensor calculus, you're just gonna love what this paper's got to say. Uh, but it concludes with a statement that I think every human being can understand. And this is the conclusion. Any universe that expands on average has a space-time beginning implying a causal agent outside space and time who creates space, time, matter, and energy. Now, two of the three authors of this paper, Arvind Borde and Alexander Belinkin, they spent a decade of their career searching for some way where they wouldn't be stuck with this causal agent. And during that period, they did publish some papers where they say, here's how we can avoid the causal agent. But every one of those models would not permit the existence of life. And so what would they recognize is in order for life to be possible, the universe must be expanding. And every expanding universe model is subject to the grip of the space-time theorems, which means there really is this causal agent beyond space and time. And it was Alexander Vilenkin himself who wrote this. I gave you this quote yesterday. With the proof now in place, cosmologists can no longer hide behind the possibility of a past eternal universe. There is no escape. They have to face the problem of a cosmic beginning. And what is that problem? Proof of a space-time beginning implies a causal agent beyond space and time who creates our universe of space-time, matter, and energy. And I was sharing with a few of you earlier this morning how I got to speak at NASA Houston a few years ago, and the director there said, I know you're here to speak on the scientific evidence for God, but I forbid you to use the word God in your talk. And I said, this is gonna be a challenge given what I'm supposed to be speaking on. But I said, how about this? Instead of using the word God, can I use the words, uh, this, this causal agent beyond space and time who created and designed the universe for the benefit of human beings? And he said, fine, you can use that. So. <laughs> which I thought was actually better because now I actually got to define God. But here's the bottom line. A transcendent God must exist. The space-time theorems prove that there must be an agent beyond space and time who created the universe. Now, if you read the latest books being put out by atheist physicists and astronomers, probably the best known is A Universe from Nothing by Lawrence Krauss. If you read these books, you discover that they're conceding deism. They acknowledge that there's no way they can avoid a deistic interpretation of the universe because of the force of these space-time theorems. The battle in terms of what's going on between atheists and theists with respect to physics and astronomy has shifted to whether or not this causal agent is a personal being. They recognize that there must be an agent beyond space and time that created everything, but people like Stephen Hawking and Lawrence Krauss are insisting that this agent cannot possibly be a personal being. So this is really the challenge we're facing as believers. Yes, a transcendent agent must exist, but is God personal, and did he design the cosmos and the earth for the redemption of billions of human beings? That's the question I want to address this morning. But before I go there, let me finish taking you through the fundamental features of cosmology that the Bible addresses, because all we've addressed so far is that first one, that mainly the Bible claims there's a singularity beginning to the universe. As much as the Bible says about the beginning of the universe, it actually says much more about the expansion of the universe. 
Now, one reason why a lot of believers have not recognized this, it's not in Genesis. It's not in the Torah, but you do see it in the book of Job that I believe is actually the oldest book of the Bible. So right away in Job chapter 9, we have the statement that God alone expands the universe. And there's actually 11 passages that speak about the expansion of the universe. I think another reason why it's often missed on people that speak English, our, trans, our Bibles typically translate the word nata as the stretching out, but it actually means expansion. And these are the texts that speak about this. By the way, as I mentioned yesterday, I've debated Michael Shermer, the executive director of the Skeptic Society, many times. And this subject often comes up. And Michael realized if he concedes that the Bible speaks about the expansion of the universe, it proves that the Bible has predictive power because the Bible was the only book that spoke about this expansion. So what he did in the debates, he insisted that all these passages were simply figures of speech. The Bible's not really saying that we live in an expanding universe. He says, you, Hugh, are reading this into the text because you're a 21st century astronomer. Well, if you actually look at these 11 texts in the original Hebrew language, you'll notice that the verb nata shows up in all three Hebrew verb forms, which means it literally is speaking about the expansion of the universe. And by the way, it's not just astronomers like me that are reading this into the text with the knowledge that we do indeed live in an expanding universe. This was recognized by Jewish theologians living 800, 900 years ago. But yeah, the drama here is no book of science, philosophy, or theology outside of the Bible even hinted that we live in an expanding universe apart from the Bible. For thousands of years, the Bible stood alone as the only text making this claim. Now, I've written a whole book, The Creator and the Cosmos, establishing why indeed we know we live in an expanding universe. I don't have time to give you the most compelling reasons why that must be true, but I will give you a visual one. And thanks to the Hubble Space Telescope. So here are two Hubble Space Telescope images and over here, we have a, an image of galaxies located 12 billion light years away, contrasted with a different image where we're looking at galaxies 2 billion light years away. And I purposely set up these two images to the same spatial scale. So what you see here is that the galaxies are 2 billion light years away, which means we're seeing the galaxies as they were 2 billion years ago. See how much farther apart they are? than galaxies that we're looking at that are 12 billion years back in time. And here we notice the galaxies are jammed so tightly together, they're tearing spiral arms off one another. But as you move forward 10 billion years, this phenomena has virtually disappeared. And if we had time, I could show you dozens of other Hubble Space Telescope images that basically show you with respect to time, indeed, the universe is stretching out. It's expanding where the galaxies are getting farther and farther apart. And seven times in the Bible, it tells us that the laws of physics do not change. And by the way, there's a good reason they don't change. God set them in place to be tools for redemption. And so what we see in Jeremiah 33, for example, is God speaking to the Jews and saying, you change your mind all the time but I don't change. I'm the immutable God. As proof that I'm the unchanging God, look at the laws that govern the heavens and the earth. As they don't change, I don't change. And what you see in Romans chapter 8, the entire creation is subject to the law of decay. And as an astronomer, I can tell you it's impossible to separate the dimensions of space from the dimension of time. So when the Bible says the entire creation, that means not only all of its geography, it also means all of its history. And so this law of decay has remained fixed and constant for the entire history of the universe. But this is a fourth feature. Repeatedly, the Bible speaks about how everything in the universe is subject to a pervasive law of decay. And hey, look around you. We're all evidence of that ongoing decay, right? <laughs> I mean, my hair used to be black, it's not anymore, <laughs> so. Now, 
I remember doing a debate at the University of California, Santa Barbara, where a quantum atheist physicist there said, I want to see the Bible making a prediction with hard numbers that we can put to the test through actual measurements. And I responded to him later by saying, hey, Notice what the Bible says, space-time beginning, expansion from that space-time beginning, under laws of physics that don't change, where one of those laws is a pervasive law of decay. That implies that the universe must get colder and colder as it gets older and older. I mean, it's the principle of thermodynamics. It's how you got here this morning if you drove here. Your car engine has pistons in it. And when the piston chamber expands, the temperature goes down and your gasoline stops burning. And when the piston chamber compresses, the temperature goes up and it can reignite the gasoline, assuming you've got a diesel engine. That principle applies to everything in the universe. So with an expanding universe, it gets colder and colder in a highly predictable way. Now, if we know the age of the universe and we can measure that through a dozen different ways, we get a biblically predicted cooling curve for the universe. So this line you see here, this curve, that's the biblically predicted cooling curve uh, for the universe. And overlapping that are 13 actual measurements we astronomers have made of the past temperature of the universe. The latest measurement is this one right here, where the air bar is so tiny, it's thinner than the thickness of the line, but it perfectly fits right on that line. So this is a dramatic example of the Bible making a numerical prediction thousands of years ago that we can put to a hard test through actual measurements and it passes the test with flying colors. One of the most dramatic demonstrations that the Bible indeed has predictive power. And if the Bible has predictive power, it must be inspired by the one that did the deed. Okay, let me go back to this question. Is God personal, and did he design the universe and the earth for the redemption of billions of human beings? Today, we not only know that the universe is expanding at just the right rate to make human beings possible, we know what's responsible for the expansion of the universe. It's something called dark energy. We only discovered it back in 1999, and it's the energy that's embedded in the space surface of the universe. And by the way, all the stars and galaxies are constrained to the three-dimensional surface of the four-dimensional expanding universe. And here's, here are some things we know about this uh, dark energy. It makes up about three-quarters of all the stuff of the universe. I find it interesting that we humans were ignorant of the dominant component of the universe until 1999. It's actually a question you see in the book of Job, chapter 38, verses 19 and 20. Do you know where darkness resides? Can you take me to its place? Now, when I was a student studying astronomy, I was told that darkness was the absence of light. Job says it's an actual substance. Today we know Job got it right. It indeed is a substance. Moreover, it makes up most of the stuff of the universe. And this dark energy works in the following way. The more the surface of the universe gets bigger as the universe expands, the more powerful that dark energy is to accelerate the expansion of the universe. Now here's the situation. If you expand the universe too slowly from the cosmic creation event, gravity will collect all the gas of the universe and compress it into nothing but black holes and neutron stars. And the minimum density of those bodies is about two billion tons per level teaspoonful. So dense, molecules are impossible, atoms are impossible, even protons and electrons are impossible, and of course, life would be impossible. On the other hand, if you expand the universe too quickly from the cosmic creation event, gravity is not gonna be able to collect that gas to make any stars at all. If there are no stars, again, there's no possibility for life. And so astronomers have calculated to what degree must we fine-tune dark energy so that we can have stars and planets where life can possibly exist on the planets. The answer is you have to fine-tune it to one part in 10 to the 122nd place of the, de of the power index. It ranks as the greatest fine-tuning example we can measure in all of science. Now, 122 zeros after the one, it's kind of hard, hard to visualize. I'm gonna to try to give you a lay person's appreciation for what that fine-tuning design makes. 
How many of you have heard of the discovery of gravity waves back in February? Okay, it's probably going to win the Nobel Prize. And, so, and I got articles on our reasons.org website. By the way, it's a far more significant discovery than what they announced on TV. Uh, I won't go into it, but it's, it's an amazing discovery. And that discovery was possible because we, we basically put into effect the world's most sophisticated instrument. The gravity wave telescope that we physicists have been able to design and build is so amazingly designed, it can measure movement of the mirrors to within one-tenth the diameter of a proton over the course of four kilometers. That's how amazingly designed this telescope is. Now, that ranks as the epitome of human engineering creativity and design. But if we were to compare this best example of human creativity and design to the design we see just in dark energy to make life possible, it ranks 10 to the 97 times inferior. In other words, the design we see in dark energy is 10 to the 97 times better than the best human example we've been able to produce. Now, it was physicists at Caltech and MIT that invented this machine and designed this machine, and it was your tax dollars that made it all possible. But what this comparison tells us is that the one that designed dark energy to make possible the existence of light, at a minimum, is 10 trillion 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 times more intelligent and better educated than those Caltech and MIT physicists. Now, I've worked with these people. They're not stupid. They're prob <laughs> they, their rank is the most brilliant individuals on the planet, but they do not compare to the brilliance and the education of the one that designed dark energy for a benefit. Or to put it another way, this transcendent causal agent at a minimum is 10 to the 97 times better funded than the U.S. government. <laughs> now, that was a more powerful argument a few years ago than it is today, but uh, it basically makes the point that this causal agent must be a personal being, because only a personal being can manifest the attributes of intellect, knowledge, creativity, power, and care for his creation. And by the way, it's not just people like myself, Christian astronomers, that are seeing this feature of dark energy. It's been appreciated just as well by atheist theoretical physicists. And I brought a paper here with me, published by three atheist theoretical physicists, and it's titled, Disturbing Implications of a Cosmological Constant. That's another term for dark energy. And when this paper was published, the atheist physicist editor of the British journal Nature interviewed them. And this is published in Nature. And this is what they said in the interview. Arranging the universe as we think it is arranged, say the team, would have required a miracle. And that's an amazing statement for three atheist theoretical physicists to make. But they went on to say, an unknown agent, namely beyond space and time, intervene in the evolution or the history of the universe for reasons of its own. That explains the title of their paper, Disturbing Implications. <laughs> Very disturbing for these atheist theoretical physicists to acknowledge that there must be this agent beyond space and time performing miracles for reasons of his own, which explains why they closed off their paper with this sentence. Here's the final sentence in their paper. Perhaps the only reasonable conclusion is that we do not live in a world with a true cosmological constant. In other words, they said dark energy must be wrong, because if dark energy is real, then we got this agent performing miracles for reasons of his own. And certainly that can't be, so dark energy must be wrong. The irony of this paper is it was published just months before we astronomers came up with nine independent observational demonstrations that not only is dark energy real, it's the dominant component of the universe. And you'll actually see a set of articles on our reasons.org website where I list and describe for you and explain for you these nine different demonstrations that dark energy definitely is real. And that's the URL that you can go to 
uh, reasons.org slash articles, and there's the rest of the URL uh, for them. By the way, if you go to that URL, you'll actually find that I've added another 16, because today we have 25 demonstrations that dark energy is real and the dominant component of the universe. What does that mean? It means this transcendent causal agent really must be a personal being. He has designed the universe for the benefit of our human beings. He's performing miracles for the benefit of the human species. Now, dark energy ranks as the most spectacular evidence for fine-tuning design, but it's not the only one. Virtually every feature of the laws of physics and the features of the universe reveal this overwhelming evidence for fine-tuning design. So here are a few examples. Now, in order to have stars, stable burning stars, it's crucial that the electromagnetic force be stronger than the gravitational force, and the ratio of the strength of those two forces must be fine-tuned to one part in 10,000 trillion trillion trillion. If that doesn't happen, stars will never exist, or stars will form and immediately explode. Both ways, no life is possible. You also have to fine tune the number of protons relative to the number of electrons to better than a trillion, 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 much better than that, for life to be possible. Now, it tells us in, uh, by the way, the C stands for carbon-based life. I say that because a couple of times I've debated uh, atheist physicists, and they say, well, what about life that's not like we know it? And I says, oh, you mean angels. And I said, definitely we have a different set of fine-tuning for angels than we do for us human beings. But for, as far as the universe is concerned, carbon is the only game in town. You can only build life on the carbon molecule. There is no other element in the periodic table which will permit the existence of life. So that's the only assumption that comes to bear there. But if this design is a supernatural handiwork of the God of the Bible, we would expect this list to grow as we learn more about the universe. And indeed, that is the case. Job in Psalms says the more we study the book of nature, the more evidence we'll uncover for the handiwork and the attributes of God. You'll see that repeatedly in those two books. So starting in 1991, our scientific team at Reasons to Believe went through the scientific literature and discovered there were 17 different features of the universe and the laws of physics that showed this extraordinarily high level of fine-tuning design. But notice how the list has grown with respect to time. It's now over 200 different features must be fine-tuned, demonstrating the principle that the more we learn about the book of nature, the more evidence we'll see for God's handiwork and for his personal attributes. And by the way, you can go to reasons.org slash fine tuning and you'll see the documentation and the citations to the literature uh, that will establish that this indeed uh, is the case. And we've taken it to the level of the universe in terms of our galaxy. Let me put it this way. You can go to a bookstore, any secular bookstore, you can go to the University of Texas bookstore and you'll find about 50 books written in what's called the Anthropic Principle. And most of those books are published by physicists and astronomers who are not believers. But they all agree that when we look at the universe as a whole, in the words of Paul Davies, we see overwhelming evidence for design. But that's typically where they stop. What we have done at Reasons to Believe is to say that if, if there's this overwhelming evidence for design on the scale of the whole universe, and this is the handiwork of God, we're also going to find it in the scale of our galaxy cluster, our galaxy, our planetary system, our star, and the features of our planet. And so beginning in 1995, we began to look at the features, fine-tuned features of our galaxy and our planetary system. And back in 1995, we found 41 different features that have been scientifically identified that had to be fine-tuned to make life possible on any body that could exist in the universe. And this probability here is the probability of us finding that kind of body without invoking divine miraculous intervention. That was one chance in 10 to the 31st power back in 1991. 
Notice it's now one part in 10 to the 1,050th power that we're gonna find such a body today, 824 different features. By the way, I've been accumulating a database that I haven't had time to update, but I can tell you this, the number of features that must be fine-tuned is well over 1,000. But even if you look at that last column, the probability that you're gonna find a body anywhere within this vast universe of 50 billion trillion stars with a possibility of being able to sustain any kind of advanced life, that probability is more remote than someone in California winning the California lottery 150 consecutive times where they buy just one ticket each time. Or as a mathematician friend of mine put it, it's the same probability of winning the California lottery 150 consecutive times where you don't buy any tickets at all. <laughs> so, but if you actually look at this last column, what you notice is that the probability that it's the God of the Bible that's responsible for us being to live here on planet Earth, that probability is getting roughly a factor of a million times stronger per month. And frequently when I'm on a university campus, I'll say to the skeptics, if you're not persuaded today, wait a month. Now let's see what happens to the accumulating evidence. If that accumulating evidence goes up by factors of thousands or millions, then you need to seriously consider the claims on your life that are made in the Holy Bible. Where else in apologetics can you go where you get a million times more evidence on a monthly basis? This is, again, the power of the astronomical evidence. And here's a quote from Freeman Dyson, not a believer, a uh, famous physicist. And he says, the more I examine the universe, the more evidence I find that the universe in some sense must have known we were coming. This is a consensus. Regardless of the theological perspective of astronomers and physicists, they all agree here uh, with Freeman Dyson that when you look at the universe, you can't avoid the conclusion. It was designed for the specific benefit of us human beings. Now, I want to close with this. It must also have known that the Creator intended to redeem billions of human beings. Let me take you back to Romans 8. The whole creation groans, and it goes on to say, the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. Now, when I read the Bible and see statements like this, it drives me to the why question. What is it about the law of decay that helps bring about the freedom and glory of the children of God. And so as a physicist, I said, I gotta understand what's going on here and recognize that we actually live in a universe that has the optimal physics for the defeat and the removal of evil and for willing human beings to receive redemption. That applies literally to every law of physics. It applies to every dimension of space and time. It's all been designed to bring about the removal of evil and suffering and the redemption of billions of human beings. Now, I've written an entire book on this, why the universe is the way it is, but let me just pick out one example. Because the Bible really focuses amongst all the laws of physics mostly on this law of decay. Okay, what we notice about the law of decay, the decay rate is not so high as to discourage productive work. Now, my wife always tries to get me to do yard work. But one of the things that discourages me from doing yard work, I can spend four hours in her backyard making the backyard look really nice, and then about 10 days later, I gotta do it all over again. It's like, the rate of decay is so high here, what motivation do I have to maintain the backyard? So, I'd rather write a book. A book is gonna last a lot longer than the lawn in my backyard. However, the rate of decay is not so high that it would discourage us from all work, okay? It's low enough that we'd be say, hey, I can produce stuff, and yes, I've got to maintain it, but it's going to last a while. But notice this, the decay rate is not so low as to let sin go unrestrained. And it'd be great if I could do yard work and it'd be maintained for a good year. But if the decay rate were that low, then there wouldn't be adequate restraint against the human expression of sin and evil. Let me take you back to Genesis chapter 3. Adam and Eve rebel against God. 
and God pronounces some consequences upon him. Basically says to Adam and Eve, because you have now chosen to walk away from me, to rebel against me, from now on, you'll experience more pain and more work, and it implies more wasted time. Now, God intended that work uh, would be pleasurable. He also intended that the sense of touch would be pleasurable. But because of our sin and our evil, we now experience more pain, more work, and more wasted time. And by the way, none of us likes that. And because we despise having to work harder, experience more pain, and more wasted time, this acts as a powerful motivation for all of us to avoid evil and to maintain a path of virtue. But it also teaches us that we can't do it without help. I mean, we try to say, okay, you know what? I'm gonna get a, you know, a whole lot more work if I go along this path. We discover we're not able to prevent ourselves from committing sin and evil. But we look at the universe and we realize the God that created the universe is all powerful and all loving. I'm not able to deliver myself from the consequences of my sin and evil, but based on his power and his love, he must have provided a way out. And it was Job himself who acknowledged that God himself has provided the way out and he was going to count on that way out. Now, I describe this in this book, Why the Universe is the Way It Is. Basically take you through the laws of physics, explain why the universe must be as big as it is, why it must be as old as it is. All of it plays a role in making possible the redemption of billions of human beings. Uh, let me close with a couple of short stories. Uh, I was on an airplane once, well, I was actually waiting for an airplane, and uh, I got called up to the front. That's not always a good sign. And uh, they said, uh, you know, Mr. Ross, uh, we have to give up your seat. Can we put you in first class? And I said, I think I can handle that. So <laughs> it's only the second time in my life I ever flew first class. And I wound up being seated beside this gentleman, and he said, I never fly first class either. But he says, Microsoft is insisting on flying me first class. I'm consulting for them. And I said, well, what do you do? And he says, well, I'm a quantum physicist. I'm from Germany, and I'm an atheist and a skeptic. Now, <laughs> rarely do people introduce themselves that way to a total stranger. <laughs> so he said, well, what do you do? And I says, well, I'm not a quantum physicist. I'm an astrophysicist. And I'm not a skeptic and an atheist. I'm a Christian. And he said, this is going to be a really interesting flight. <laughs> so, and he peppered me for two hours with eight questions. First question he asks is, well, if God is responsible for this universe, why does he waste himself by making 200 billion galaxies? Certainly one galaxy would be enough. And maybe we don't even need a galaxy. Why not just our planetary system? Why not just the sun and the earth? So I explained to him why you needed exactly 50 billion trillion stars, no more, no less, for life to be possible. You can't even get carbon and oxygen unless the universe has a highly fine-tuned total mass. And so he said, well, I've got another question. And then he went on with another question. And then he finally asked me, he said, why are you so pre well prepared to answer these eight questions that I gave you? And I said, well, the eight questions you asked are all chapter titles in my book, Why the Universe is the Way It Is. And I said, you're not the first person to ask me these questions. I said, I get these kinds of questions all the time. And he says, I got to see this. And I said, well, I actually have a copy of the book in my briefcase. So I pulled out this book and he looked at the table of contents and says, you're right. These are the eight questions I was asking. And as we walked a baggage claim together, he calculated for me the probability that a German quantum physicist who's an atheist <laughs> would be seated in first class beside, uh, you know, an astrophysicist who is a Christian. He says, it's way less than one chance in a billion. And he says, I know what happened today is not an accident. He took a copy of the crater, in the, of the, pardon me, why the universe is the way it is. And as we're walking to baggage claim, he says, you know, I'm German. And he spoke excellent English. But he said, do you have anything in German? And I said, yeah, I do. I gave him a copy of our DVD, uh, Journey Toward Creation. It's in 11 languages. And by the way, at our table, the book is there and the DVD is there. 
So you can be praying for the German quantum physicists. And uh, I'll close with just one more quick story. And uh, it features this thing. It's a DVD you'll see out there. It's called The Great Debate. That's not the title we put on it, because this debate happened at Caltech at the International Skeptic Society Conference. And it was a two-day conference where they brought in leading atheist scientists from all over the world to speak on the non-existence of God. And then they had me at the very end debate uh, Victor Stenger, a particle physicist. And uh, the great debate is actually the message you've heard today. When I had my chance to speak, what you heard today is what I gave them. And what you're going to be able to see in this debate is how an audience of 700 highly educated atheists from around the world responded to what they heard you, what they act, actually what you heard this morning. Now, I'll tell you the response, because it's not on the DVD. What they told me afterwards was, this is the first time they'd ever heard a scientific defense of the Christian faith. They said, we've been exposed to many debates between Christians and atheists, but this is the first time we heard a scientific defense. I says, well, it probably gave you the idea that we Christians don't have a scientific defense. I said, that's exactly right. We assumed that science was on our side. We had no idea it was the other way around. The other thing they said is the first time we've seen a gracious defense of the Christian faith, which is why I want to leave you with 1 Peter 3.15. Always be prepared to give good reasons for the hope within you, but with gentleness, respect, and a clear conscience. The unbelievers out there are waiting for us believers to respond with grace, humility, and wisdom.